that is a nightmare more terrifying than any other. A nightmare that has haunted thousands of people all over the world. It felt as if there was a male presence there who was evil. I can remember seeing this, this figure in the doorway. I just knew it was female. A presence comes into the room, paralyzes its victim, then leaps on their body and assaults them. It hits me so hard at times where it just it knocks me off my mattress. She's choking me so hard that I think that my voice box is going to uh, collapse. Sometimes it's a shadowy figure, sometimes an old hag, sometimes a demon. But whatever shape it takes, the entity, as it is often called, has concrete effects, leaving its victims battered and exhausted, their lives in pieces. Sufferers are sure that when they see it, they are awake and it is real. Science, psychology, and religion have all grappled with this phenomenon. Can any explain the mystery of the entity? One woman has been suffering from entity attacks for most of her life. They began when she was just five years old. The first thing I remember as a child at night, um, I had just gone to bed. My mother just put me to bed, and I could see um, the lights on in the living room. I had just laid down for bed. I could hear my parents. I could hear the television. And I looked up, and to my right, I saw a couple. Um, very shadowy, very dark in my bedroom, a uh, man and a woman, and um, they started walking towards me. It's very frightening. I couldn't speak. I, I, I wanted to call out to my mother. I couldn't call out to her. I was just terrified. And right about that time, she walked into the room, and she walked, it appeared that she walked directly through the two people that were standing to my right. And I began asking her, uh, who are these people in my room? What's going on? Uh, she kept telling me that it was just a dream to go back to bed. And I said I wasn't asleep. It wasn't a dream. I could hear the television on in the other room. And that was the end of that. But as Jamie got older, the entities that stalked her became more vivid and more violent, making her increasingly terrified to go to bed. As soon as I become aware that there's someone in the room, I'll go into a paralysis and I can't move, I can't shout out, I can't, um, I'm unable to call for help and I'm un unable to stop any kind of attack. Usually it's an attack. You can't move, you can't scream, um, it feels like you've been drugged somehow. The Shadow Man, and this is just a recent label that I've put on this character. The closest I've seen of him is the arm, because it's been around my throat several times. He's very violent. Um, he, he doesn't use any caution whatsoever. He, he could care less if my neck is broken. I mean, that's how violent he is. Generally, he's accompanied by a very old woman. She's rather short, um, draped in many layers of clothing. She looks like a homeless type person. Like every, all of her belongings are on her. A shawl, jacket, a hat. The old woman will sit on my chest and um, she's not extremely heavy, but she's heavy enough that it's very hard to breathe. It's extremely hard to breathe. I can't, I can't get my lungs to expand. He'll have me around the base of my neck. She'll come up to the top part, and she's choking me so hard that I think that my voice box is going to uh, collapse. Um, I can't move. He's got my arms down, usually, or um, just the way she's sitting on me, I can't move, and there's nothing I can do. What makes these attacks even more frightening is that Jamie is convinced she is awake. 
the fear is extremely real. You look around the room, you're looking for any way out. I can see my clock, I can see the curtains, I see everything in the room that tells me that this is real, this is happening to me, this is really happening. And I'm wondering why my husband can't hear them, why he can't hear the struggle, why he can't hear the fight. And beyond that, I'm wondering um, what's going to happen to me after they kill me, who's next? Your mind and your body thinks you've been through it. But to everyone around you that you associate with, that you work with, your friends, your family, your doctors, they say it was just a dream, just get over it. For years, Jamie thought she was alone and feared she was mad or delusional. Then she discovered there were others who had suffered remarkably similar experiences. Research for this film produced hundreds of phone calls. I was uh, sleeping in my bed and uh, there was a, a presence uh, in the room. I was paralyzed in the bed. He seemed like a shadow. Probably about six foot high. Well over six foot. Very tall. There was something sitting on my chest. Sitting on top of my chest. The lady was old and haggard. She had straggly gray hair. Kind of an old woman standing in front of me. And there was an, an old lady. This just was not a nightmare. I know that I am awake when this happens. Can't escape from this entity that has entered your room. It's a feeling of perhaps the greatest terror that one can imagine. There was a presence in the room. I thought I could see an entity, black figure. Oh shit, there's a presence in the room. God help me. Matt Watkins is a psychology student at the University of the West of England. Like others, he has experienced entity attacks for most of his life. Unlike others, he often recorded the events as they occurred. Friday the 26th, 24 in the morning, saw some things. Still feeling pretty shaky. There was definitely a presence here. I remember seeing this, this figure in the doorway. I just knew it was female, but I remember she was old, she had a haggard face. And she saw me, she looked me in the eyes, and she ran right up to my face. The way she came up to me, she glided, stopped right in front of my face, and literally two inches away from my nose, looked at me in the eyes, and she had um, what could be described as black eyeliner running down her, her face. The fear, it, it can be a tr tremendous amount of fear. If you can imagine lying um, in bed, it's dark, and you've got an intruder in the house. More than that, you're paralyzed. Your adrenaline is building up. Um, your typical human response is, is a f to fight or flight. Um, you can't help yourself, you can't defend yourself. And more than that, it's, it's an unusual experience because you know, you're witnessing um, some, some kind of hallucination um, and for some people you know, they might think this is some kind of ghost or deity. Last words were, in my mind, to get a grip. It's just the floorboards creaking. Go to sleep, there's nothing to worry about. It's made me question the nature of reality. It's made me look into many different areas. It's made me look into psychiatry, um, parapsychology, transpersonal psychology, all these different areas. I realized there could be other explanations for this and um, then I started looking into it a bit more. Matt was terrified by his visions, but he was also intrigued. He decided to make the entity the focus of his degree. Searching through ancient texts, he was surprised to find evidence of the entity experience dating back over 2,000 years. When doomed to death, I will attend you as a nocturnal fury. I will attack your faces and brooding upon your restless breasts. I will deprive you of repose by terror. 
it wasn't just literature. Many artists had also depicted the entity. In the Middle Ages, it was often represented as a horned beast that preyed on sleeping women and was sometimes thought to rape them. Later paintings saw it as a heavy demon-like creature sitting on the chests of its paralyzed victim. Why were there so many depictions of the entity experience and why were they so similar? There may be one explanation. Throughout history and across the world, thousands of people have suffered from nighttime visions in which they are attacked by violent and mysterious entities. Some people have such severe experiences that their lives are left in ruins. Every time something happens like this, I, I don't really repeat a lot of it and I try to forget it and I'm having a very hard time describing how intense it is. The fear is intense. I've woken up with, with um, cuts on my hands from my fingernails, clenching my fist. I cracked teeth during my sleep just from the intensity of everything, uh, clenching my jaws. I, I did think a few times about uh, taking my own life. Uh, you just don't see any out to it. it. What happens is when you get to the point where you're so tired, you're just so tired, and you're so tired of fighting, and every night you know when you go to bed it's going to be another fight, a struggle. You become afraid to fall asleep. For some of these entity attacks, science may provide one explanation. When we are dreaming, a mechanism in the brain paralyzes us to prevent us acting out our dreams. Some people get trapped in a state between wakefulness and dreaming called sleep paralysis. Dr. Al Shane has studied over 9,000 cases and believes that it may have been experienced in mild form by up to 30% of the world's population. Sleep paralysis, as uh, I view it, is a type of dream, a waking dream, or perhaps more accurately, a waking nightmare. Uh, imagine, if you will, there are two mechanisms um, deep in the brainstem of the brain. And uh, one of these mechanisms we'll call the wake-up mechanism, and the other one we'll call the dream-on mechanism. And they're linked to one another. In particular, the wake-up mechanism inhibits the dream mechanism. So when this one is turned on, uh, you're awake, alert, conscious of your surroundings, able to respond to your surroundings. Imagine that as your wake-up system turns down, if there's a problem with particular neurotransmitters, it may not be inhibiting the other system. So this one may turn on before this one turns off. So you have two systems on now. So you're awake and you're dreaming. If sleep paralysis might help us understand why these visions seem so real, can it also help explain the shared scenario experienced in the attacks? A way in which the uh, uh, hallucination might build uh, might be from the case in which uh, you imagine that there's something on your chest. Perhaps it's simply the fact that you, you can't take a deep breath because you are paralyzed after all. One interpretation is that because there's something on your chest preventing you from taking a deep breath. If you've also had a visual hallucination, uh, it's easy now to conclude that whatever that thing was, that is now what is on your chest. Uh, initially, often it's simply a feeling that there's something there. Uh, and you are searching for it. If your eyes are closed, you feel if you just open your eyes, it would be there. Uh, if your eyes are open, it may be just out of sight. Perhaps you will see it. Perhaps you will now start to see some form, uh, some vague shape. Maybe you'll hear something, footsteps, movement in the room. You may actually feel something touching you. And you can see as, as each of these things happen, the hallucination gets fleshed out so that this vague sense of a presence can become a concrete uh, entity in the room. The condition of sleep paralysis might go some way towards explaining why some people are visited by entities, but there are other attacks which reportedly go much further. In spite of a normal childhood, Mark Gillen has suffered from particularly disturbing nocturnal attacks since he was a teenager and still finds them difficult to talk about. Um, I was 
only about 17 um, when this first happened to me. I went to bed as normal, fell asleep, um, enjoying a good sleep. When probably in the middle of the night, um, I was wakened um, by the, the feeling that someone was in the room. I couldn't explain who it was, I didn't know who it was. Um, I then felt being totally paralysed, the fact that I could not move at all. It was as if the, the power that was there, the energy, was able to control my body. I was being held down um, from, from the back. I could feel his hands on me. I could feel that it was a man. I could feel the size of him. I knew that the size of the, the, the person that was there. Um, it was a fully grown man. What happened next was, was a sexual act. As if I could feel him pushing himself on top of me. I thought I was going to die. I thought that they were going to kill me. When, when the paralysis uh, eventually went away, I felt as if the presence had withdrawn into the corner in the room that there was some creaking, not literally moving, but it was creaking as if there was something there. Mark's alleged ordeals have been so severe that they have caused a strain in his relationship with his fiancée. Varev refuses to talk about this um, for one reason. Um, we went through a terrible time with it. I think the fact that I've not been able to cope with this as well as what I should have done has actually contributed towards a lot of the problems that we've actually had in the relationship. Um, I still hold possibly a lot of anger. I still have a lot of feelings in my mind as to, you know, what's happened to me. Um, have I been going mad? I'm, I'm fed up with with going to going to bed and worrying. Mark's attacks are horrifyingly real to him, but Dr. Shane believes that a scientific knowledge of how sleep works might explain not only these attacks, but also the myth of demonic assaults on medieval women. Sexual assaults are not common, but they certainly uh, occur. Uh, during REM, uh, males have erections. Uh, there's also uh, clitoral tumescence in women, so that our dreams uh, have sexual content because our sexual organs and sexual uh, areas of the brain are being activated. So it's not surprising that the combination of fear and sex leads to a sexual assault scenario. But for Mark, this leaves one crucial element unexplained. His bedroom was once his older brother's. Um, a couple of years before this happened, um, my brother actually had this room. He was he was staying in that bedroom. I started to tell him what had happened to me in that bedroom. He did actually say to me that he had very similar experiences. Um, he'd he'd gone through certain things the same, such as feeling of being strangled, feeling of someone being there. Um, he, he didn't go into too much detail and just probably the same as me, frightened to talk about it. Is it just a coincidence that it was just the same, the same bedroom? Um, don't know. While some suggest that sleep paralysis is hereditary and can therefore explain such cases, others believe that entity attacks might be associated with places as much as people. Professor David Hufford has been studying the entity phenomenon for over 30 years. His research has been inspired by his own experience. Years before I started working on the topic in an academic way, I had a sleep paralysis attack of my own. I'd never heard of anything like it. Uh, it had all of the features that I later found in traditions all over the world. I heard footsteps, I had a terrifying presence, I felt a climb up on the bed, I couldn't move, I thought I was being killed, it was terrifying. Um, I never told anybody about it for the obvious reasons. Most people in our society don't. I didn't want anyone to think I was crazy. Uh, and then years later, when I got to Newfoundland and came across the old hag experience, I didn't even know at the time that it was sleep paralysis yet, 
uh, I thought, what's going on here? How can these people have a tradition about what happened to me uh, in a completely different country? Uh, I just had to follow it. Hufford carried out his research in more than a dozen countries. He felt that while sleep paralysis might account for people who felt pressure on the chest, it could not account for those who felt it on other parts of their body. The experiences were just too varied. It's common during sleep paralysis for people to report pressure, most often on the chest. A sense of pressure on the chest could be caused by the paralysis of the voluntary muscles involved in breathing, but sometimes it's other places. I've had people say the pressure felt like it was pushing their head down through the bed. Other people said it was pressing on their feet so hard they were afraid their legs would be broken. I would like these explanations, if we're going to buy them, to really line up with the data consistently. So far, these don't. Most puzzling were instances where entities seem to attack not just individual people, but entire communities. <laughs> Villagers on the isolated island of Pemba, off the east coast of Africa, claim that they have been plagued by an entity for more than a decade. Like Mark Gillen, some also feel that it has sexually assaulted them. They call this entity the Popa Bawa. Since the attacks began ten years ago, the villagers have called upon their spiritual beliefs. Now many of them carry protection against the Popa Bawa in the form of pages from the Holy Quran sewn into a purse which they keep on them at all times. Singuvu is for kwa mwiluangu tuni mzito. Yani kumbia mzito unaweza kafahamu. Si mzito wa kilo. Ni kumbia kili nifika tu pali kata hakunivamia lakini kunivamia nyewe kili nivamia laki hakunivamia kama kina wafanyo inzangu. For the villagers of Pemba, the supernatural nature of entity attacks is accepted without question. Only 200 years ago, Western cultures would have taken the same stance. To this day, the more signs fall short of a full explanation for these terrifying encounters, the more some sufferers have been tempted to look beyond the rational, towards the religious institutions which recognize that supernatural phenomena may be real. I personally witnessed some of the things that Ted was encountering. In the West, sleep paralysis may be the principal medical explanation for entity attacks. But many sufferers find this diagnosis inadequate due to the intense reality of their experience. This conviction is even stronger for those whose encounters are apparently witnessed by other people as they occur. With no one else to turn, 
one man has fallen back on his religion and a Catholic priest who accepts that his accounts may be real. I've been hit by like an unseen force. It, it hits my chest. It hits my, it penetrates right through my head, through my body, through my chest. It, yanking my legs it hits me so hard at times where it just it knocks me off my mattress. Sometimes I'll wake up after getting assaulted or I, after getting paralyzed and I'll see a stream of black or white smoke just kind of streaming out of my, like my bed, my pillow next to my face or just, just floating in midair. Ted Philippone lives in Greenwich Village in New York. He claims that he's been suffering from entity attacks on a nightly basis since he was a child. They are so severe, he can no longer hold down a regular job. It's putting so much fear within me that I'm unable to sleep, that I feel that I, I have to keep opening my eyes to see if there's something in the room. It's affected my mood, it's affected my depression, it's totally rendered me literally useless to society, useless to everybody. With no regular income or family support, Ted has turned to the church and now lives in a Catholic hostel under the supervision of Father Pat Maloney, who claims to have witnessed these strange events. At one particular time, he seemed to be very upset, not so much agitated, but almost fearful. And he said, look, it's at me again, it's bothering me. I said, what is bothering you? He said, you don't believe me. I said, of course I believe you, son. But So I laid in the corner about a foot away from him, got just that little bit closer, and I felt an immediate type of a vibration, a, a, a physical presence of some kind. And yet I did not feel that whatever was bothering or obsessing Ted was malevolent. It was as if he were attracting some force something outside of our dimension. Father Pat is not the only one to have observed the phenomenon that has surrounded Ted. His girlfriend of five years also claims to have seen these entity encounters. We were just sitting on the couch watching TV and I guess facing the bathroom door and um, the door was open, the bathroom door was open and I saw some type of uh, grayish silhouette walking out of the bathroom. Um, you couldn't really like define the shape if it was male or female. It was just some type of silhouette, very tall, and it was just like cloudish, grayish, and it was walking towards Ted's bedroom. Then he said to me, "Did you see that?" So I was like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "Did you see that thing coming out of the bathroom?" So I was like, "Okay, I must not be going crazy." So that's the first time I ever saw something like that with Ted. Although one of Ted's doctors believes he is suffering from sleep paralysis aggravated by a traumatic upbringing, the fact that his encounters have been witnessed makes them more difficult to explain. In a way, every case is sort of remarkable and, and very highly strange. The ones, though, that, that really just amaze me are the ones where more than one person is involved, where one person is having the sleep paralysis and hearing something or seeing something, and somebody else in the house hears or sees the same thing at the same time, even though they're not having sleep paralysis. Why, how do you account for that? I just, I'm, I'm baffled uh, by a good reductive explanation for that. He's seen the best psychiatrists. He's been through medical doctors. We've tried everything. I've tried praying with him. I've tried all the things I know how. And I am still convinced there is something there. While academics find Ted's experiences baffling, age-old religious traditions are less surprised. In fact, they suggest such experiences occur regularly and are even treatable. Lou Gentili is a demonologist and a devout Roman Catholic. He claims that he has often helped people in Ted's situation. We've arranged for him to come to New York to see what his methods might reveal. Demonology is the study of fallen angels. It's the study of things that are evil, whether it be religion, whether it be demons, devils, things of that nature. I come across cases that are malevolent, evil, demonic, or diabolical, 
on a monthly basis. Out of a month, I may get five or six cases, you know, that are truly have activity that are evil. Lou and his assistant go to the hostel and meet Ted for the first time. They will interview him extensively to try and determine whether his attacks are psychological or supernatural. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you some questions. Some of them are going to be maybe a little bit personal, but it's all going to be to help you, okay? I'm not here to harm you. I'm not to, here to exploit you or anything else like that. I'm here to find out what's going on. I would give anything for all these experiences that I'm going through to totally come to an end, to totally stop. Are you currently using any illegal drugs? No. All right. Have you ever taken hallucinogens? No. Nope. This means acid, anything like that? No. Nope. Have you ever submitted to a sleep study? No. Nope. Have you been diagnosed as having any psychological ailments? Narcolepsy, Tourette's syndrome, disassociative personality disorder? No. Nope. Nothing like that? Okay. Are you willing to get help if it turns out that what is happening to you is purely psychological? Yeah. After two hours of questioning, Lou decides that Ted's case warrants further investigation. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to remotely be watching him from another location, actually right above him. And I'm going to set up a laptop with a video camera feed that's going to be showing me video of what's going on and also audio of what's going on. And if anything does happen in here, I'll be here in the room within a matter of seconds. Right now, we're directly above Ted, and we're monitoring him. All of our equipment is set up, and we're waiting to see if anything happens, if any movement, any kind of globules appear, okay, which are balls of light. See what happens now that we're all set up. Ted said that something grabbed his leg, uh, went on video, we see his leg go. I'm gonna be going down there with him and uh, I'm gonna sit in there and uh, you know, I'll see what I get on tape because I'll be running EVPs also. EVPs, or electromagnetic voice phenomena, are recordings of inexplicable sounds which some people believe are supernatural. It is claimed that these recordings can capture spirit voices, which exist on a frequency beyond human hearing. Since he's claiming that you know things were touching him before, and that something actually pulled his leg, I'm going to sit by him. But I'm going to be asking some questions on the recorder and see what we get. I've tried communicating with it, and not only did nothing happen, not only did I not receive a reply the assaults got more intensified within about 10 minutes of asking. Beginning of EVP, July 30th, 2001, at precisely 2.45 a.m. If there is a spirit around us now, please tell me your name on the recorder. Are you a spirit that is out of the light of God? Please release whatever has been performed on Ted. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. End of recording. As expected, there is no audible sound in the room. But when the scene is played back from the point of view of the recorder, an apparently different picture emerges. The tape recorder begins to register unusual sounds after each question. There is a spirit around us now. Please tell me your name on the recorder. Are you a spirit that is out of the light of God? Please release 
whatever has been performed for him. Then Gentili mentions Jesus. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The sound that you just heard in some people's minds could be portrayed as static discharge, which to me is, is ridiculous because I've heard the things scream blasphemies, okay, in people's houses, um, and include the client's name, people's names, people who aren't even a part of the, of the case. Uh, what you heard is, it's as real as it gets. After hearing the sounds on this recording, we decided to have the tape analyzed by forensic experts. They suggested that the only way similar sounds could be created would be from rubbing the microphone or through a remote receiver, neither of which were apparent during Lou's investigation. At the end of the night, Lou gives Ted his opinion. You know, what we talked about before, about the faith and things like that, I think what's happening here is this thing is driving you to the way you are becoming because of the way that, that your faith is, and you need to, to reaffirm your faith. And all these are scare tactics, that's it. They're gonna try and scare you. They're gonna poke you, they're gonna prod you, they're gonna hit you, things like that, but they're not gonna get completely violent because somewhere in your heart, you do have faith. You just haven't brought it completely out yet. So if I lose total faith, it's gonna get more violent? Yes. And all I want is just to sleep peacefully without always sleeping with one eye open, looking at the corner of my eye, opening, closing, opening, closing, just to see if there, there's an entity in the room. I question myself, why is this happening? Why can't it just stop? It seems to me that he has a supernatural, preternatural, and a psychological problem. As far as the spiritual side of things, we're gonna try and get him back into his faith. The idea that Ted is being harassed by an evil spirit may sound bizarre, especially in a world which prioritizes scientific proof. But there is one case of nocturnal assault that goes way beyond even the most extreme entity visitations. For one man believes that the entity is not attacking him from the outside, but from within. Although researchers believe that entity attacks can be rationally accounted for, it's the sufferers that have to deal with the disturbing consequences. Whilst many claim that an entity is threatening, and in some cases sexually assaulting them, one man and his family believe that it may actually be possessing him. I think he's possessed because when he's awake, he's not violent. And he just don't look like himself when he's having a night terror. He don't sound like himself. He has a terrifying holler. Uh, his eyes are glazy looking. They're, they just don't look like him. Cody McKee and Monica Forrest have been together for seven years and have two children. In spite of a violent adolescence, Cody's biggest problem is the mysterious attacks that plague his sleep. Although he appears to be seeing something, he cannot remember any detail of his attacks, unlike his family, who now fear for their lives. I really don't, I can't recall none of it. It's like I go to sleep, I wake up, and. I don't know what I did, what made me do what I was doing. It's just, I mean, I feel like, like she said, possessed. I feel like something jumped in my body and made me just go crazy. Show you the holes. These are some of the holes he's put in through the sleep tears. When he put his fist through the fan, he went in through the front and out the back and into that wall. I've knocked holes 
through walls. I've stuck my hands in fans. I've knocked holes in the door. I've tore the tip of my toe off. His foot or his toe or something went through that. I think it was his toe. The only night that I can say that uh, I that it really felt to me inside of me like something jumped inside of me and took over my body it was the night that I jumped through the window. This is the window he went out. It's like somebody threw him out the window because he did it from a dead stand. He just went out. And that's all I heard. He hollered and out the window. Whenever I come to behind her daddy's car, I heard somebody, I heard a word, somebody say, I see a letter, Cody. That's the only words that I heard, and I woke up, see you later, Cody. And I started walking back up to the trailer, and as I got closer to the trailer, I realized that I'd done something, and I got to seeing, you know, I was cut, head to toe, had 60 or 70 stitches. But it is not just Cody who has been hospitalized by these violent attacks. The night he broke my nose, I thought that he was going toward my child. So, and that's all I could think of, and so I grabbed him to wake him up. And uh, I believe he, when he brought his arm back is when he hit me. I mean, waking up and seeing all the blood and seeing her crying and seeing her nose, just, I mean, there was actually a bone stuck out of her nose, you know, where it come through. And knowing that I did that to her was, it just, it messed me up for a long time. That night, I decided not to sleep in the same room with him. And I was just locking the door then, and he had another one. He ran and hit the door, and the door, with the door locked, it flew open. So then I decided to start moving stuff in front of the door. He's got it to where it won't lock. If you just close it like that, you pull it back open. So I have to pick up on it and make sure it's locked. Then I pull this bed like that. Then I pull this up against it like that, that way he can't, he can't come in. Yet, he hasn't been able to. When he hits the door now, it'll crack like that much, as far as he can get it. This is ridiculous, having to go to sleep like this. You know, most people just go to bed, and you, can't, you have to protect yourself when you go to sleep. Unable to afford medical guidance, Monica and Cody grew fearful that his attacks were being triggered by an external entity. We arranged for Cody to be seen by a sleep clinic to see if they could explain his nocturnal awakenings. This is the most extreme case of uh, sleepwalking and uh, night terrors that I've seen. Uh, these have been reported in others, uh, but this is the first one that we've had here at our center to this magnitude. While Cody spends a few nights at the sleep lab, doctors will study his brain activity and muscle tone, as well as record him sleeping using infrared cameras and sound monitoring equipment. If you need anything at all during the night, the intercom will be on all night. Don't hesitate to let us know. Okay? All right. Let's get in now. All right. Love you. Love you too. All right. Okay? All right. Good night. During the first night of monitoring, Cody appears to wake up terrified. The EEG machine shows that he is still in deep sleep and not dreaming. If Cody isn't dreaming, what could be provoking him in such a way? Next morning, Dr. 
Dr. De Villa studies the tape. You had a, an awakening there out of deep sleep, but your uh, eyeballs were moving and you looked pretty scared there. Do you remember anything like that? No, I don't ever, don't ever remember nothing. You don't remember being in a nightmare or having a dream or at, at that, on that particular night? Mm -hmm. And Monica, have you seen him show those eye movements in the past or has he opened his eyes? No, I usually don't wake up till he hollers. Okay. It looks wicked to see my eyes open like that. I mean, it just don't look like me, really. His, his eyes are darting around. It's hard to know whether he's actually seeing anything or not. Uh, he doesn't have any recall of opening his eyes. He doesn't have any recall of seeing anything frightening, although he looks frightened. In Cody's case, um, we cannot find a specific trigger. So he is a mystery in that sense, and um, we cannot determine what is going on in his mind. But in his case, for some reason, he is fighting to get into wakefulness and alertness and literally fighting his way into that. Dr. De Villa believes Cody is suffering from an extreme form of sleepwalking that occurs during the deepest stages of his sleep. But what Cody actually sees, or why he is driven to such violence, still remains a mystery. Whatever the medical explanation, Cody is still no nearer to understanding what causes his attacks. They haven't gave me a reason why I do it. They haven't told me, you know, they don't know why I do it, what causes it. All they know is they can put me on medication and maybe it'll stop it. And, you know, I hope it does. I hope I can take some medication, go to sleep at night and rest. And don't have to worry about hurting anybody or hurt myself. Cody has now been taking the medication for over three months. Although his attacks are reduced in number, they still occur and are as unpredictable and violent as ever. For many who suffer from nocturnal assaults, their testimony is evidence of an experience that is still not fully understood. I've seen lots of different explanations offered as the scientific explanation of this. In general, and in fact all of them that I've, I know of, do not fit the data of the experience well. Now maybe someday people will be able to get to the point where they really do fit well, but I do think that it's not fair to people's experience and people's understanding of this sort of thing to take a, a loose, sloppy, hypothetical scientific explanation and figure, well, at least it's scientific, we ought to accept it. No, that's not right. Uh, it ought to really account for what needs to be accounted for. None of them do yet. Good luck, everybody. Keep working on it, but let's not claim that it's been done. Whether or not science will one day offer a full explanation for these nocturnal attacks is unclear. What is clear is that those who suffer will continue to live in fear of what lurks on the other side of sleep. <laughs>